a lot, a lot of the times when I speak at things like this, and I'll do Q&A at the end, the questions I get are things like, what's a good revenue per head for a business like mine, for, for an agency often? Um, what's a good net profit percentage? What's a good staff, to, staff cost to turnover percentage? And whilst they're valid questions, I would suggest that they are intriguing at best. At worst, they were just a complete distraction from what you should be doing, which is building your own plan and measuring against that plan. I'm only so interested in what other accountancy firms are achieving because I have my own plan and I want to be measuring our performance against the plan that I set up. So if another agency's got a higher revenue per head than you, that might be because they're growing slower and therefore they can take more time to make efficiencies and, and to drive profit. They might have a lower revenue per head because they're growing faster and they're investing in the company and investing in the team. So although most of our clients operate in the same industry, we do also respect that every business is unique and also your journey is unique and where you are in your journey is different from where other people are on the journey. It's one of the first exercises we do, and I'm sure you'll be talking about this a lot with the guys at Form, is to work out your own plan. And that starts by looking at your personal goals. And everyone talks about personal goals and it's probably become a bit of a cliche, and you, you know it's important, but actually getting business owners to build a personal plan that they take seriously and build a business against it is quite hard because we come very consumed with the day-to-day -day ongoings of the business and the challenges and the risks and the things that we want to do and the opportunities. But continuing to tie that back to your personal plan is what keeps us sane because we can't do everything. All the things that are available for you to do now, you can't do it all and you certainly can't do it all at once. But your personal plan enables you to build a business that helps you to achieve your personal outcomes. And then once we've got that and we start to understand what personal income you need, household income you need, what working hours, working patterns you want, what you want your role in the business to be, what luxury purchases, travel, family time, health and fitness interests, etc., you can build a business that is achievable within those boundaries. If I didn't have my two kids, I could grow my business faster than I am now, but I'm not willing to sacrifice less time my children to grow the business faster. That's why I make the decision that for the next few years I'm going to cherish those years and then I might accelerate it a bit quicker afterwards. But if you don't have these boundaries in place in the first place, you'll be constantly beating yourself up that other people are achieving more than you. You could be going faster, you could be working harder, but that's not what it's all about. So this plan is about getting your personal goals right, getting your financial plan right, working out what services you're gonna be known for. And this is particularly important for an agency or a tech business, there's so many things you could be providing that you can't possibly be the best at them all and make them profitable and enjoy them and, and them help you to achieve your strategy. So it's about working out what are the few things that you're going to be the best at that are going to drive the numbers and the interest in your business. Then what clients are you going to serve? Again, we don't just want to grow 20% year on year with clients that you don't be working with. You want the client makeup to be one that you're proud of. And this is again where I think a lot of accountants get it wrong they focus so much on the numbers but underneath the numbers is a business with clients and people and services and if those things are not in line you might tick off your, your profit and loss account you're achieving your numbers but you're not achieving your strategy and you end up with a business that's not the one that you want and then as I say finally team what's the actual makeup of your team and where do you want it to be in 5, 10, 15 years time so you can start to work a plan towards getting there is that all making sense? Mm -hmm. So at the end, um, as I say, John, if you give me like a five minute nod at the end and then I'll, I'll take time for Q&A then. The fact that you're all thinking about your businesses and removing yourself from your business today to think like an investor and think about what things an investor could look at is brilliant. And that ties into actually getting to the point where the business is performing regularly and ongoing as well. And that's actually the part of finance that's probably most important to all of you, most of you on the journey that you're on now. Um, and we've become very well known for using technology at the heart of our clients' finances, but technology is only there as an enabler. It's there to help to streamline the finances. It doesn't actually solve anything. And our advice to clients is always just get your systems working first 
don't care whether it's Xero or Sage or QuickBooks or Excel or a fag packet. It's get the numbers working and often businesses will use the technology as an excuse. We're not tracking our KPIs yet, we're not doing management accounts because we're working out what technology to use. Six months later you meet them, we've not worked out our KPIs yet, we've not worked out our management account because we're still looking at which technology to use. Just get doing it. I think for all the benefits of technology, one of the drawbacks is it does cause people to just go numb and stop and, and not make decisions and not, make, not move forward. So again, loads of advice about out there, what you should use, but the best advice I can give is to just get on with something. And even if that means moving in six or 12 months time, if you upgrade your CRM in six or 12 months time, you upgrade your accounting software, you won't lose all that work you've done. You'll just replicate the good routines that you've got in, into, into, the, into the new program. Um, but what actually happens is businesses get led by the technology and they see this technology, it looks good and it's got nice features. And then they, they jump in and use it, but there's nothing, on, there's nothing wrong within there. It's not solving a problem that they're actually looking to solve. So most of our clients uh, are using Xero as a, as, as, as a platform, um, the fastest growing account and software in the UK. They've now overtaken Sage in terms of users in the UK, uh, predominantly from Australia. And the reason we decided to partner with Xero is just that, again, when I set up, I thought there's a danger that I'll end up getting sucked into spending loads of time on systems and choosing the technology and working out the technology, whereas actually businesses don't care. They just want it to work. So they want us to get on with something quickly so that we can start adding value, giving them insights, measuring the numbers that matter. So we decided one partner and it'll be zero because we're accountants, we can use anything. We should be able to. <laughs> Businesses need something that's user friendly and easy for them to be able to log in, get a dashboard, make basic transactions and read basic reports. Um, and zero and it enables you to do that. It's a very user friendly platform. And it now has in excess of 700 add-on applications that have been very clever and open up their API and letting all this technology integrate with it. So similar to the technology issue, I would say it's the same with KPIs. If you spoke to 10 different consultants today, they would all tell you a different um, list of KPIs that you should be focusing on and they'd all disagree. And then your head starts getting, going around in circles trying to work out what you should be reporting on and the best thing you can do is just to choose some and just track them all the time because the real value most of the metrics mean kind of the same thing especially if you're a service business that are about lab labor utilization effectively even if you're selling based on value the ultimate driver of profit is going to be making a return on the people that you employ and most of the KPIs revolve around that so instead of jumping from should we do net revenue per head or gross revenue per head recovery rate, utilization, et cetera, et cetera. Choose a defined list and just keep tracking them. And it might take six months before you actually get any like, meaningful patterns from it, but you want that six months to start now, not in six months when you figure that out. So don't worry too much about getting insights from the data initially. That will come later once you start to build the patterns. And sometimes it, you know, it takes a lot of work just to track this data. So just getting into the point where someone's responsible for it and it's happening and it's, at first it's probably going to be inaccurate, timesheets haven't been filled in properly, invoices haven't been raised properly or whatever and you'll start to iron out those cracks and track the, the right KPIs in the right way. As I say, work on your own plan, not what the benchmarks say. Interesting to know what other agencies are doing but don't pay too much attention to it because it can become a big distraction. People. Uh, now, the, the buzzword seems to be about dashboards. Everybody wants a dashboard. But I don't think necessarily people know what they mean by a dashboard. They just like the idea that there's so much chaos and so much going on. That I like the idea of a small uh, amount of information that I can just look at at a glance. We're gonna go through that shortly. If you run a service business and you've got your budget right, you know what you're gonna spend money on in the next year because you've worked out what the priorities are, what are the things, what's the training we need to invest in, what's the advertising marketing, what's the office space, et cetera, et cetera. The day-to-day -day metrics, which is kind of what I think of when I think of dashboard, it's the thing that I wanna see day-to-day, -day, is really all around revenue because you've worked out already your costs. All that mental energy has gone, gone in up front. We've decided the things we are gonna invest in and we've decided the things we're not gonna, go in, gonna invest in. We know how much money we wanna make and therefore the balance and figure is revenue and we map that revenue out over a 12 month plan and look at 
how much revenue we want to be driving and when. Then you have some uh, monthly targets to aim for around revenue. And clearly, you need to be prospecting for more revenue than you actually need because not all of your proposals are going to come off. Uh, typically, again, rule of thumb, uh, aim for a 50% conversion rate. So if you need a million quid's worth of revenue in the next year, you want to be producing proposals to the tune of about two million. Again, tell me I'm wrong. If in your business you're achieving 67% or 33%, then use your number, not mine. Uh, that's just something to start from if you're not sure or you're just starting out. And then when it comes to targets, again, I think one of the weaknesses of accountants is getting focused on what's interesting to them as opposed to what's interesting to you. And many of them will use percentages um, that people can't relate to. People can't relate day to day to a percentage. They can relate to a number. So with your revenue, you want a number. This month, we want to get to £167,000 worth of sales. On day three, we're at 43,000 um, and get people to work towards a number. And don't forget, employees don't think like you. They can't think as creatively and as holistically as you. You want to simplify things as much as possible to get them focused on the one thing that matters and be reporting that everywhere in your business all the time for them to be working on it. So day-to-day -day metrics, as I say, you know what your revenue target is because you've worked that out when you put your strategy together and you're very clear on how much revenue you need to make and that's been driven by how much you want to earn, therefore how much profit you want to make, what you're going to invest in, and then you, the revenue to pay for all of that. So on your day-to-day -day dashboard, every one of you should be able to look at how much revenue do we need to be able to make this month, this quarter? How much have we made so far? What have we quoted? And what, th how much therefore of that quoted revenue do we need to convert in order to hit our targets? Such a simple thing, like none of this is rocket science, but we get clients who com come in who are not doing this recently we've been working with them for about 18 months and they felt that aiming for two million pounds worth of turnover in their next year was going to be really difficult we can never see more than a month or so ahead um, we've never had I think it was 2.5 we were going for which meant they'd obviously have to get to the point where they're doing two, 200,000 pound months revenue months and that seemed too far-fetched for them just getting them focused on this means that now they're like two or three months ahead of hitting the targets. So right now they've hit all the September targets, they've hit all the October targets, and we're now looking to fill up November and December just by having that focus. Um, and it's, it, it, it's because there's deadlines on it. You know, sales opportunities can stagnate and take time and time and time, but you need to be able to hit your revenue targets if you're gonna achieve the financial budget that you've set. And then on a monthly basis, um, this is where we produce management accounts for our clients. So we'll present them with a management accounts pack and we'll deliver that over like a five to 10 minute video narrating what's gone in in their business and narrating the, the, the performance for the month, where they've uh, varied against budget and why, and some things that we want them to think about to get to, to perhaps get back on track. But then what we'll do is summarize that into like a KPI page that can be shared with the team and can be used as the headline figures. So revenue for the month, operating profit for the month, an operating profit margin and then the same year to date as well so you might have one or two bad months throughout the year but you want to know year to date are we on track with our revenue are we on track with our profit are we on track with our margin and you're comparing all those three against your budget so can you see why seeing something like revenue per head compared to this <coughs> is of limited use because your revenue per head in month three could be much higher than it is in month seven because you've not recruited the people yet or it's a busy period and if all you do is track basic indicators like that it's really things like revenue per head are a way of allowing consultants to see whether in a coffee shop and listening to your numbers whether they're any good compared to another agency before they got under under the under the skin average days for clients to pay that's your debtor days how quickly are your clients paying you Again, if you're a service business, the biggest bottleneck to cash once you're profitable is getting paid. Um, and we'll actually go a step further and list that out per client as well. 
So you might have a decent debt a day, so like to say it's 30 days, but you've got one client who should be paying on 28 and they're paying on 45, but it's masked with the other good payers. So listing out actually who your clients and how quickly they're paying you. So many horror stories with businesses that believe their, their debts are gonna come good and their clients are gonna pay them and they're acting on, li living on trust and relationships and they go sour and their profit for that year is wiped out by one bad debt or they can't pay the bills because the client's not paid on time. Cash reserves, so again, some more principles, all well and good making profit, but every single business that has gone out of business has been because they've run out of cash. And many of those businesses were profitable, but they didn't get cash in the door quick enough. And then the retained revenue, which is up, retained revenue, should say retained profit. So that's all the profit that you've accumulated today in all the years you've been in business. So it's not just looking at this year in isolation, it's, it's then what accounts call the net book value of your business. What's the, what's the value of everything that you've built up over time to get to today? This is about listing all of the people in your business that drive revenue and looking at how profitable they are as a person. Profit per client, so again, not average, but actual listing out your clients, what's the profit on each of the clients. You can do all this stuff in a spreadsheet. All you need to know is the revenue that's associated to any client and then the, the time and materials that have gone against them. So the time of your staff times the the cost of those staff per hour, and then any freelancers, outsource costs, etc., that have been absorbed into that client. Profit per uh, product or service. So if you've got SEO and pay-per-click and creative and web development, you want to know which of those are profitable and which ones aren't. Um, revenue per client is closely linked to client concentration. So it's making sure that no clients are too big a share of your revenue, which is a big issue with many agencies. I think the worst we've seen is like 80%, like 80% of the revenue comes from one client. It's just, I don't know how they sleep at night. Um, knowing that that client at any moment could, of course, serve a notice period, but effectively 80% of your team can be made redundant at any moment from that client leaving. That is extreme. Um, normally it's much lower, but ideally you don't want any one client making up more than about 15% of your revenue because your profit should probably be about 15 to 20%. So it means that actually you can still break even with if that one client was to go. But when we talk about this for clients, it's like, uh, yeah, okay, we've got one or two clients that are too big a portion of our revenue, but so what? Should we ask them to stop spending money with us? Well, clearly not. Uh, but you should have enough business development activity to be able to build a bigger client base around them. And the, the, the uh, risk is that you don't do that. And because you've got this client that's sucking up all your time from an operational relationship perspective, you never actually dedicate the time to, to business development. Um, and it's the same with recruitment as well. Some businesses are good at the business development activity. They do it all year round. They don't wait till they need a client to start doing marketing business development. But they don't apply the same thinking with recruitment. So you wait until somebody's left or you're desperate for a resource and you hurriedly start jumping onto all the recruitment agencies and paying them through the nose to get average candidates and it still takes ages. And it's because you've not been treating your recruitment pipeline in the same way that you would your business development pipeline, which is that it's all year round activity. One of our clients runs um, Major Titans. Have you, any of you heard of that in Manchester? Um, so it's like a developer conference and the first year when it had like 250 developers coming from all over the world and like these massive speakers wanted to be involved in it and it was to train and educate developers but what John's been smart with is that he knows that that's 250 more eyeballs on his business exactly the kind of people that he wants to recruit mm -hmm. so it's thinking about how you can build a clever strategy that enables you to build up interest from people who could work with you without it being a, there's a job at the end of this. So it was one big app. Pardon? It was one big advertisement. Yeah, and every year, every year. Like how many of us would kill to have 250 prospective candidates for free? You know, that, that, that event broke even, effectively just charged enough to make it break even. And then all the online exposure we get off the back of it as well. So that's a bit on business development. And then recovery rate is about, you might have a charge out rate of 90 pound an hour, 100 pound an hour, 
400 pound a day, 500 pound a day, whatever it is. But just because that's what's on your rate card doesn't mean that's what's actually getting billed to your clients. So recovery rate looks at the revenue that you've earned divided by the chargeable hours in a period. And again, just tracking one key metric like that over time <coughs> and just forcing it to go up by a pound a month over time makes huge compound um, improvements. And the other thing about that data I think is like finance doesn't actually solve anything. It just helps you to start looking at your business in different ways. No one understands your business better than you. I'm not, I can't come in, John can't come in and tell you what you should be doing to run your business better. What we can do is create the data and ask the questions. You know, why do you feel that recovery rate's down? Is there more information that we need? Um, and it's just getting those questions being asked regularly and reporting on that data regularly that gets the good quality conversations going that then we can work together and start to understand how to improve the numbers. Thank you.